Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, October 30th, and this is the weekly market update. So anything that you see or hear on this video or here on the podcast is not to be taken as investment advice. This is not legal or financial advice of any kind. These are opinions given by a random guy on the internet. Do your own research and due diligence. It's your money and your responsibility. So I'm putting this out a little bit late. Actually, I'm actually recording this at uh, nine o'clock on Saturday night. Uh, had a lot of, um, had to work today, had to stay late, had contractors that had to get some work done in the substation. So as you can tell, I still have my day job or afternoon and night job, it seems. Uh, so, you know, I'm still trying to figure out how to take this thing full time. So I wanted to get this out. Um, I'm trying to stay on the schedule. I did have some time during the day to put the slide deck together. So hopefully, um, I'm a little bit tired, but we'll see if we can get through this and give you some value. So first things first is uh, Cameco had their Q3 um, conference call. And this is a quote from the Cameco CEO. The fundamentals of our business are as positive as we've seen them in over a decade and maybe ever. Um, obviously, it is the job of the CEO of Cameco to talk his own book, to put things in the best light possible, but uh, they are bound by certain uh, laws too. So for him to say, to say that this, the fundamentals of the business are the best they've seen in a decade and maybe ever, that's a pretty strong statement. You know, I used to um, report all of the Cameco quarterly reports. I uh, haven't done so so often just because um, there's a lot of people talking about uranium now on Twitter and on the internet, on YouTube. I've said what I needed to say on it. It's just a waiting game now. But I thought this particular conference call was uh, had some really exciting news. And so I wanted to go over some of the snippets from the call uh, that I thought were pertinent. And these are all direct quotes. You can, uh, I'll put a link to it. It's on Seeking Alpha. You can look up the transcript, but I'll put a link to it. In a world where 85% of our electricity still comes from fossil fuel sources, it is time for climate realists to step forward and acknowledge that there is no clear pathway to sustainably achieve both electrification and decarbonization while maintaining a secure, affordable, and stable electricity grid without having nuclear in the toolbox. Absolutely, we've said that. I think one of the things a lot of people are assuming is that the people that are pushing uh, the climate change narrative want sustainability, want a stable and affordable uh, electrical grid. Um, I think these people are anti-human for the most part. They don't like growth. They don't like people. They don't think a lot of them like themselves. So um, we can't just assume that, you know, they don't want business as usual. Let's put it that way. They want less economic activity. They want to take over people's lives and, you know, kind of Sovietize them, you know, have everybody living in smaller places with less things. That's so you have to consider that that's actually what they want. So I think this is the method they're using, which is climate change, but that's a whole nother discussion, probably not appropriate for this venue. While demand for nuclear and uranium is becoming more certain, uranium supply is becoming less certain as years of persistently low prices have led to have led to supply curtailments of existing productive capacity, lack of investment in new productive capacity, and the end of some reserve life for some mines. Yeah, we've been reporting that for the last three years. You know, no one is going to spend a billion dollars or whatever and take 10 years of their life or longer to build a uranium mine um, when the price, you'd be selling the product as a loss. So um, we have been living off the previous investments that were made during the last cycle. And so basically uh, the industry is in liquidation. You are slowly but surely 
taking the reserves that were found, uh, the productive capacity that was built during the prior cycle. At some point, the price will rise sufficiently and a new cycle of mine building and such will take place. But, uh, you know, that's, or at least many analysts or people that we follow that are much smarter than us on the subject feel that that price is substantially higher from where it is now. Here he goes on to talk about the uh, Sprott Fund. There, there are several financial vehicles that seem to be trying to address the same problem as we see. Undisciplined pr producers jamming their uncommitted material through the spot market. So, um, you know, the, the uh, Sprott vehicle is addressing that. You know, Cameco has been a consistent buyer of, there's so many companies. I mean, if you remember back, we've reported on this, so many various mining companies that were out buying uranium at, you know, spot uranium, a half million or a million, a million and a half pounds here, whatever. And uh, I think that that's, uh, that's obviously helpful, right? It takes uh, this stuff off the market. So um, continuing, they put spot here, but it's a uh, transcription. I think it meant spot. As the spot market continues to thin, utility interest in on-market long-term contracting is emerging. Now, this is important because they see this. I mean, they're the 800-pound gorilla in the market, right? So they're going to see a lot of interest they're going to be receiving RFPs, requests for proposals. They have the information. I mean, they're not going to tell everything uh, on these calls, but you're getting a sense of where this is going. Utilities are beginning to shift their attention to securing material for their uncovered requirements and not just in off-market negotiations. Requests for proposals have come to the market as well. Sprott effect on the market. This is just uh, some things up here in notes. I think, and this is what they said. I think it is at least tightening up for sure. And yes, we are reaching a pinch point. So uh, this is what Cameco is seeing. They think we're reaching a pinch point. Uh, talking about the contracting cycle. I would say, here's the good news. This is the early innings. One of the data points we often refer to is that since Fukushima, utilities have consumed over one6 six billion pounds off of term contracts signed in the past, but they've only come into the market to replace about 800 million of that. So, you know, one of the things I saw on Twitter, there's still a lot of arm wrestling among different analysts or people that presume to know a lot about the uranium market, about how much material is really out there. You know, I saw a Twitter, um, back and forth about, well, there's so much material out there and then, you know, there's not enough material. We don't really know. We do know that no one's building a new uranium mine that I can tell of. No, no new material, um, you know, low prices cure low prices, I guess is the point I'm trying to make. We're not seeing this rush to build mines and oversupply the market. So the canard of Kaz Adam prom flooding the market once the price got to $40 a pound, I mean, they've exactly done and said the exact opposite. They're treating their uranium reserves as a business for the benefit of Kazakhstan, and they will not be, you know, operating like it's a Soviet five-year plan where we must hit the production, increase production every year for the sake of doing it. Uh, that's, that's not going to happen. So overall, very positive comments. Um, I think it just reinforces that, you know, we're in a uranium bull market. I, I'm just going to say, it. you look at the charts, the long-term charts, you know, everything has turned up. We had a long bottoming process that's over with. We've turned up now. And so, you know, if nothing goes straight up, there's going to be pullbacks. There's going to be, uh, there could be within the, within a longer term bull market, there could be periods of, you know, uh, weakness. And my suggestion, if you think that we are in a uranium bull market, you should buy on the dips um, if you do not have a full position. A lot of people, I have new subscribers coming on all the time and they're like, well, have I missed it? Should I buy? Listen, I mean, we're going substantially higher than we are here now. I don't know the timing. You know, that's a mugs game, making predictions about price and dates. 
I don't do that, but it's obvious that uh, something that's been trading below its cost of production for so many years uh, is not, and it has use, it has a very useful, is in a growth industry. I mean, uh, it makes sense, right? So um, I don't get into the short term, you know, what's going to happen in the next week or month. This is a longer term phenomenon. And, uh, but, you know, I'm speaking from a, a point of strength too. I, I was buying these stocks when they were, you know, way, way lower when nobody cared about them. So there is more activity. Uh, but uh, no, I certainly, I think that we're in a bull market and one should be adding on dips or establishing their position and adding on dips. That's what I suggest you do if you are interested in participating in this uranium bull market. You know, I don't get caught up in all, for the average person listening to this, just buy one of the ETFs. Don't try to get cute. You know, all these little, you know, you have these little Twitter wars where you have these guys on there and they have their favorite company, right? They have their their horse that they're riding and they defend it and they back and forth. I mean, if you, want, if you have that kind of time and you have the ability and the uh, geological training and you know the market, then yes, go out there and do that. My suggestion is buy the, buy the ETF. Um, you're going to get a, lar lar a good diversification in most of the large caps. You're going to get a good slug of Cameco and Kaz Adam Prom in there. And then if you want to take some of your, you know, do that with 75% of your uranium allotment, then with the remaining 25% buy, you know, four or five, six speculative names and swing for the fences. But just to go all in on one name and then, you know, for whatever reason you've decided uh, doesn't seem to make sense to me. So uh, you may get lucky and hit the one that goes up 10,000% and you may, hit, you know, get on the one that underperforms. It's difficult to say. You know, recall that most of these companies will never produce a pound of uranium. That's something that I really am fascinated by that a lot of people are talking about the mine value and how this company A or B or C is going to build the mine. None of these companies are going to build mines for the most part. The last cycle, I think there was one company that brought a new mine on that was Paladin. So you have to be, you have to really understand that. I don't think a lot of people do. These are burning matches. They're speculative vehicles. So here we go. Uh, I saw Cuppy when he referred to this, he used the term new shooter, like at a craps table. So we have, you know, we talk about Sprott, but a lot of people forgot about yellow cake over in the UK. And so yellow cake's now going to be buying more physical uranium. So they had an announcement last week. They have the intention to conduct a non preemptive placing to raise proceeds of approximately $150 million. I mean, that's not like the same size as Sprott, obviously, but it's still more money coming into this uh, uranium spot market. The company intends to use the proceeds of the placing to fund purchases of physical uranium of approximately 3 million pounds, approximately 1 million pounds from Kaz Adam Prom at a price of $47.58, and approximately 2 million pounds from Curzon Ur Ur Uranium Limited, uh, who has committed to providing the company with up to 2 million pounds uh, at a price of $46.32. So uh, the company believes that the current level of the uranium price offers a compelling buying opportunity. Increased buying and continued supply discipline have tightened the market, driving the price of U308 up 54% this year to date. So um, we've got a new shooter at the table. And uh, this is we just keep seeing these announcements. We just keep seeing more positive news uh, as it relates to the nuclear and uh, uranium sector. And uh, this is uh, to our benefit. We just sit and wait now. Uh, that's what I'm recommending. I'm not really doing, I'm, I'm a generalist investor. I'm not uh, buried in, you know, spending eight hours a day on uranium stocks. It's one, one section of my portfolio. It's done very well. I think it will continue to do well. There are going to be some people that we read about that, you know, put a couple hundred grand in or a couple 10,000 and they have, they're have they going to be multi, multi-millionaires. I don't roll like that. I used to. Uh, I'm spread out over uh, various things. Now, th this uranium is a fairly large portion of my portfolio. It's probably a quarter of my portfolio right now. So that's bigger than I usually like to go, but that's where I'm at. I don't intend on increasing it, but uh, that's where I'm at. That's what works for me. 
So I think we have a problem here in the oil market. Um, I don't think the spare capacity and the ability to increase prices is really there, or not prices, but production. And, you know, we have a situation now where we're in a full-blown energy crisis. We have oil. Really, the consensus is that we're going to make a run at about $100 a barrel. I mean, among a lot of the traders out there, a lot of the trading houses, people that know. I'm not talking about the schlubs on the street. They still haven't caught on to this. But, uh, you know, here's an article which I thought was interesting. As oil races toward $100, consumers tell OPEC Plus enough is enough. The U.S., Japan, and India are pressing for higher oil output. Biden will discuss energy with leaders at G20 this weekend. Well, that's really great. I uh, hope he, you know, puts his depends on. I guess when he met with the Pope today, he uh, had a bathroom accident and had to I don't know. What a mess. Uh, anyways, so for the past year, oil consuming countries have become increasingly anxious at crude's resurgence. First to $50 a barrel, then 75, now to more than 85. And when Vladimir Putin, one of the leaders of the OPEC plus cartel, warned that $100 a barrel was a distinct possibility, well, it's not a distinct possibility. It's going to happen in the first quarter of next year, uh, maybe this year even. The alarm bells really started ringing. Of course they did. These people have in the West, in these Western liberal democracies, have bet it all. It's all in on the green revolution, build back better. You, you've heard me talk about it. And uh, I showed a uh, picture last or maybe a month ago was one of the um, for my YouTube thumbnail was a picture of the earth. You know, it showed kind of the. Uh, the Earth there, and it was like, okay, uh, the curvature of the Earth, and then an asteroid flying towards it. So the Earth, I put the caption, you know, stock markets, world economies, and the asteroid coming in was $100 plus oil. And that's what's going to happen. Um, there has not been sufficient investment in new productive capacity to forestall what's going to happen. Now, I would suggest to you that once the price gets over $100 a barrel, uh, you will see more investment, but it's going to take time. And uh, you're going to, I guess you, could, you very possibly could get to a level in the oil price where the price gets so high that it causes its own rationing. You know, another thing people don't understand, it's not like, you know, beef or something you know the price of beef goes up people switch to chicken or fish or whatever or switch from steak to hamburger that kind of stuff i mean oil is not um it has to be bought you have to go to work right you have to do certain things uh and so the ability to substitute is low and the ability to um not purchase it there's an economic term for it but it's late and i'm forgetting it off the top of my head so anyways, going on with the article, behind closed doors, an intense campaign is being waged to convince OPEC to speed up its output increases, according to multiple diplomats and industry insiders involved in the context. Well, they are increasing by, the plan is 400,000 barrels of production a day, and I think it's going to increase into the end of the year. But the problem is we're seeing more and more news come out about various OPEC countries that can't produce up to their quotas. And why is that? We reported on that. Nigeria, Angola, Algeria, now even Kuwait. OK, uh, we, we, we talked about that last week. So, you know, these countries are not like the United States where private People own the oil and they pump it and there's leaseholders and you become, you know, like Jethro Bodine or whatever and strike oil Beverly Hillbillies. The state owns all of the oil in most of these countries and the state uses the oil industry and the revenue from the oil industry as a piggy bank for social payments to stay in power. And so the ability to reinvest into productive capacity was curtailed when the price of oil collapsed or went down during first during the shale uh, revolution, if you want to call it that, during the shale boom, as prices were kept uh, low because of the uh, abundance of the shale oil that was produced. And then with the COVID uh, 
demand collapse, if you will, and the pr subsequent par price collapse, I mean, that was the nail in the coffin. You're, you're not going to, you know, in March of last year, you weren't making new wells when the price was negative $40 a barrel and people were scared. And then we had all this narrative created that this was, you know, demand was never going to come back and all this other nonsense that was being put out by the media. Now this new administration that says going to get rid of oil. Uh, you know, you remember Joe Biden standing there telling that teenager on the campaign trail, I promise you I will get rid of the fossil fuel industry and all this kind of nonsense. So, uh, and in the background, they're, they're begging people to, they can't pump more. It, it, and I would suggest to you, if that thesis is correct, that the supply isn't what we think it is, uh, that OPEC can't, the call on OPEC won't be able to be met fully or at all, then I can tell you what, uh, if that becomes the mainstream thought in the financial markets, oil will get well over 100 very quickly. The private efforts come on top of recent public appeals. The Biden administration is increasingly alarmed by rising gasoline prices that have reached a seven-year high. You're darn right. You're darn right, because this causes base effect inflation. Fuel, rising fuel costs permeate everything. The cost of transportation, the cost of farming, the cost to go to work every day. You're not, you get over $100 a barrel, you can stick a nail into the uh, Biden administration. It's all over, okay? That's what they're worried about. What about the Green New Deal? What about Build Back Better? What about 12 years until disaster? What about all this nonsense? And in the meantime, they're begging for more oil production because they know if gasoline gets to $5, $6 a gallon, it's all over. It's all over. And you have a, you have a congressional midterm coming up next year. And if oil prices, or God forbid, oil go, makes a run to, to the old highs of $150 a barrel and gas is in some areas $7, a, I mean, forget about it. It's over. That's what this is about. So... Uh, We found ourselves in an energy crisis. Amos Hochstein, America's top energy diplomat, said this week, reflecting a view broadly held, reflecting a very a, a view broadly held by big oil consuming nations. Quote, producers should ensure that oil markets and gas markets are balanced, unquote. Well, maybe they can't this time. That's the problem. So this was a Goring and Rosenswag blog, and the gist of it was, you know, talking about the fact that the IEA has consistently gotten oil demand predictions wrong. They've understated, uh, and they've bought in. They bought in. They sold out to Build Back Better and Green New Deal and a permanent plateau, lower plateau for oil demand after the pandemic and all the other nonsense that was put out last year. And so they're stuck. They, they're stuck. Um, giving predictions for oil demand that are inaccurate. And so what does the article say? Underlying demand trends have remained extremely strong even in the face of such measures. In many cases, oil demand never fell as sharply as expected and most often surged back faster than anyone believed possible. That's correct. When we had the pandemic shutdowns, I was shocked that oil didn't drop more. I mean, I think oil demand dropped from like 100 million barrels a day to like 92. It, I was shocked that it didn't drop much more than that. I mean, that shows you how inculcated oil is into everything that goes on. During the worst of last year's oil route, analysts questioned whether demand would ever regain its old peak. Remember, we just talked about that. that if you recall, that was the big narrative last year. The IE laid out a, quote, sustainable development scenario, unquote, as recently as October 2020 that concluded oil demand may have peaked in 2019. Wrong. In both the U.S. and China, where most restrictions have been lifted, they're talking about pandemic, oil demand has already surpassed all-time highs. Uh, same can be said in India. I don't know if it's all-time highs, but they're back to pre-pandemic usage. Neither country is yet back to normal in terms of air travel, and so demand will likely continue to surge from here. Um, international flights into the U.S. go back to normal, I believe, on November 7th. Uh, that's uh, one of the things is uh, kerosene or jet fuel demand has been down, but that is going to recover to uh, pre-pandemic or close to pre-pandemic highs or levels. 
And then you have the prospect of this winter being exceptionally cold, which we have talked about uh, with the La Nina and the early onset of winter. As I speak to you right now, it's in the 40, high 40s in Houston, uh, low 50s. And I know in other parts of the country, we are expecting a polar vortex sometime later in the next couple of weeks based on some of the weather forecasting that I follow. And so I think that uh, if natural gas demand uh, increases or become short or propane, you're going to see um, oil demand pick up as a substitute, which has been predict projected anywhere from 600,000 barrels a day to one and a half to 2 million barrels a day. So yeah, we've got some issues here. Um, in their most recent report, the IEA admits that demand surged by over 3 million barrels per day in June and believes, quote, robust global economic growth, rising vaccination rates, and easing social distancing measures will combine to underpin stronger global oil demand for the remainder of the year. Well, I don't know if it's because of social distancing measures, but it's because if you're going to have economic growth, you need more energy. And so um, economies are roaring back and the energy and demand is going to be there and it's questionable whether the supply will. So this is a chart of Suncor. It's a big oil sands company um, up in Canada. It really was underperforming recently. It had some issues with one of its uh, plants, upgraders, I think. Fort Hills, I think is the name of the unit. And they had all kinds of issues and the stock had really underperformed. I had suggested this as a name to buy. It's a large cap stock. They had cut the dividend last year and uh, people were really down on Suncor that, you know, this company sucks. It's underperforming. They've nothing, had nothing but problems. And then what happens? They reported a quarter that was blowout. So this is Suncor is a lesson in what can happen when oil prices rise. I've been projecting this. I've been predicting this. Not, I'm just using Suncor as an example because I don't want to talk about the, the mid, mid cap stocks that are similar that I have in the portfolio, the Canadian mid caps that are now going to be experiencing, hopefully, the same wave of cash flow coming at them, the same kind of results that Suncor had that's resulting in a re rating in the stock. And this is what can happen. This is what we forecasted. This is what we talked about. This was the thesis of why we bought these stocks. And this is, you know, this isn't even at, this isn't even at a full quarter of, you know, 80, $85 a barrel oil. So let's, let's talk about what the earnings uh, report looked like from Suncor. Cash flow provided by operating activities, which um, was four, $0.7 billion is $3.19 a common share compared to $0.82 cents in the year prior. Um, in the third quarter, the company returned $1 billion to its shareholders through $704 million in share repurchases and payment of $309 million of dividends and reduced net debt by $2 billion. This is the Walter Schloss uh, methodology of what you can do with excess cash if you're a company, there's three things you can do. Pay off debt, which is accretive to shareholders. You um, build up equity and uh, you can return cash to shareholders via higher dividends and share repurchases. As a matter of fact, I believe Suncor doubled the dividend. So they've, they're, restore, they're beginning to restore the dividend. They're buying back shares. So now what did they say? What else did they say? Since the beginning of 2021, Suncor has reduced net debt by $3.1 billion and repurchased $1.7 billion of its common shares since the start of its normal course issuer bid program in February 21, representing approximately 63 million common shares at an average price of $26.39 per common share, or the equivalent of 4.1% of Suncor's issued and outstanding common shares. The company is on track to exceed its previously communicated debt reduction and share repurchase targets for the year. So this is why the stock is re-rating. Look, look at how the stock jumped on this um, uh, report. And so what you're seeing here is a re-rating of the stock. I've seen analysts come out and say, you know, re-rated up to the mid-30s. 
um, this is this is what you want to see. And this is a large cap stock that doesn't necessarily have the same leverage as some of the stocks in the portfolio. So we should start seeing reports for many of the actionable intelligence alert portfolio companies that are kind of in the same boat. They are also um, oil sands producers, but they are mid caps. And uh, in some cases, at least in one case, I believe a better run company than Suncor. Suncor has issues. They seem to be repairing them. They're doing what many companies in the oil patch are doing. You, what you don't see Suncor talking about is using those billions of dollars to go out and buy another company. You don't see them talking about increasing production. You see them saying, you know, we're going to spend money on maintenance capital to keep our operations running and we're going to generate copious amounts of cash flow which we will pay down debt with and then we will increase dividends and buy back shares so you know they're, they've already bought back four percent of the company just this year this is exactly what eric nuttle was talking about and encouraging a lot of the companies in canada to do use their tremendous cash flow, not to go out and go nuts and increase production, but to buy back their own shares, and which I believe is going to cause uh, a re-rating of these stocks and a return of the generalist investor uh, and having these stocks move. You know, a re-rating of where these stocks could be or go back to where they were the last time oil was $100 a barrel is probably, in some cases, you know, 100% gains from here. So no, you haven't missed this run either. If you believe oil prices are going to stay at least at this vicinity as a floor, if you believe 75, 80, 85 is the floor, um, then these things don't, the oil price doesn't have to go any higher for these things to generate tremendous cash flow. Remember, these are fixed cost businesses. All the plant infrastructure is in place. There's a certain amount uh, barrel of oil price that once it's, that covers all the costs, covers all the maintenance, co covers all the debt servicing, covers all the employee costs. I don't know what that is off the top of my head. I'd have to read the uh, the the financials from Suncor, but it's some price. Let's just say it's forty five dollars a barrel on a fixed cost like that. That's all in. That pays for everything. So every dollar above that goes straight to the bottom line. That's what's so marvelous about these types of businesses. So as long as the companies don't go out and squander their uh, these cash, the tsunami of cash, then you can expect it to be returned to shareholders. You can expect debt reduction. All of these things are accretive to, to common stockholders. So that's what we've been talking about. That's what we've been forecasting. That's what, and now it's beginning to come to fruition. So I just wanted to use that as an example because it's a stock that I have been talking about in the past. Uh, and it's reflective of several of the companies in the actionable intelligence alert portfolio. So I wanted to show this. Um, one thing you have to be cognizant of, it's not all smooth sailing ahead. We have storm clouds, we've had them for a while. Um, I don't wanna be a perma bear or somebody that's constantly predicting a crash. But we are on thin ice here. We this is the um, S and P earnings yield uh, minus the CPI year over year, year spread monthly. And so, basically, what I want to bring your attention to is the bottom here, the area that's highlighted, uh, and you can see that we're down into an area where we're at now, trading uh, with this uh, earnings yield minus inflation where it's negative 2.12% level, um, your forecasted two-year returns are only 2%. Okay, so the stock market is wildly overvalued. This is just another way to show the overvaluation. You can see in the past, the threshold's only been, you know, point, negative 0.64, or is that a positive? That's a positive 0.64. Um, that's usually the turning point, right? Where stocks top out and you usually have a pullback. I mean, we're at, you know, we're at, we're at periods where we've had high inflation back in the seventies and early eighties where the stock market really struggled. I recall, now I recall this because this is when I was about 12 or 13 or 14, when I started 
um, doing point and figure charting, reading the Wall Street Journal, watching Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser, running to the mailbox during my summer vacation to get the Wall Street Journal and read it before my dad got home. And I remember the stock market, general stock market struggled. Um, we were having all kinds of issues, but I do remember all of the natural resource stocks, you know, did fairly well. Um, I remember companies like Dome Petroleum and other, uh, you know, they were just make, they were just killing it, right? Because during an inflationary cycle, the natural resource stocks were outperforming. And they were the only sector that I remember that was doing well. And then you would, you know, obviously, once Paul Volcker came in and raised interest rates and broke the back of inflation, then you had a historic bond and stock bull market uh, during the Reagan administration, the bond bull market that went on for 40 years. And then this, uh, this stock market, um, basically, that has taken off, right? So um, yes, you had your crashes here and there and stuff, but, um, and pullbacks. But what I'm trying to tell you is, I really do think that the inflation is no longer being perceived as being transitory. It appears to be sticking and it appears to be possibly being secular um, and of long duration. And if that's the case, a lot of these growth stocks, a lot of the companies that have been performing well for the last decade or longer um, are not going to be in that same situation going forward. Uh, natural resource stocks, i.e. value stocks, I think are going to outperform over the next decade. So this was a tweet I saw and, you know, you've got, this is an example of a, just more of the speculation and the bubble issues, but we've been talking about this. I've been talking about this since I've had the channel. I can show, I like to show these examples when I see them occasionally of the bubble issues conditions that are out there. And so this was a tweet that I wanted to put up. How can this possibly not be a bubble? Tesla market cap is bigger than the market cap of 14 other major global auto companies combined. So you look at the chart. I mean, that blue on the right, it's hard to see, is Tesla market cap. And here's all of these other <laughs> major auto manufacturers. So what you're saying is, what do I say when one of the two things is true here? Uh, the first thing is that could be true is that we're in a bubble and this is an indication of it because, you know, the, look at the companies that are on here. Um, let's see here, VW, Toyota, Dahmer, GM, BMW, Ford, Honda, Hyundai, Ferrari, Renault. I mean, it just goes on and on. These are all major car manufacturers. These are people that have know how to build cars. They also build electric vehicles. Some of them are very well regarded. And so one of two things is possible. One is, is that Tesla is so wonderful and so great and all of us have it wrong. It's not just a car company. It's a technology company. And Elon Musk is a demigod. And us normal people don't get it. And all these other people on the left that have been building cars, have been in the car business for 80 or 100 years, don't know what they're doing. They're sclerotic, old school, and they're dinosaurs they're gonna, that Tesla is going to push into extinction. That's one possibility. Or the other possibility is, is that Tesla is a manifestation of a bubble economy and something that we saw similar during the tech bubble, something that we saw similar during the nifty 50s uh, stocks in the 70s, early 70s, uh, late 60s, early 70s, and the, you know, the railroad stocks, you know, the, the canal stocks, the South Seas bubble. So you have to ask yourself, what do you think is more likely that Tesla is just going to take over the world uh, or that it's a manifestation of the current bubble conditions. I would suggest to you, you know my view, I believe that it's just a manifestation of the bubblicious uh, economy and stock market that we're in. So I wanted to talk about this. Uh, fertilizer prices are now moving higher. Higher fuel and input prices mean higher food prices. No one's paying attention to this. Uh, I've been thinking about this for the last two or three weeks. My uh, article, or my, this month's the November issue that will be out uh, in the first week of November of the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter. We'll discuss fertilizer. Uh, we'll have a pick in there. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, fertilizer prices are up tremendously and really no one's talking about it. As the 2021 corn and soybean crops are coming out of the fields, the supply situation for fertilizer and other chemicals is shaping up to make 2022 an expensive year for inputs. The move by China earlier this week to ban phosphate exports until at least June of next year puts even more pressure on global phosphate trade. See, most people didn't even know this happened. This was very interesting. The US doesn't buy much phosphate from China, but the country represents about 30% of world trade. Now China's traditional buyers will be looking elsewhere. Yeah, they're gonna to have to go to other places that weren't traditionally supplying them. And that's going to put pressure on the other buyers that were buying. So you see uh, when a butterfly flaps its wings, uh, all kinds of things happen, second and third order effects. Fertilizer prices have steadily risen this year according to retail prices tracked by DTN. Mono ammonium phosphate MAP is 74% higher than a year ago, while di, di ammonium phosphate DAP is 63% higher. Nitrogen fer fertilizers such as ure urea nitrate has gone up 78% from a year ago, while potash is 85% higher. Wow, these are really big increases. Um, on the urea and nitrogen fertilizers, that's a reflection of natural gas prices. But these other prices, I mean, this is another sector that has been in a bear market for like 10 years also. And so productive capacity has not been there. So you're just seeing the inflation all over the place. So when farmers go to uh, purchase these inputs, which are needed to get the yields that they need uh, out of their crops, you know, industrial scale agriculture is dependent on these various inputs into the soil. So it's not like a guy with a, you know, 5,000 acre corn and soybean operation is using, you know, cow poop uh, to fertilize his fields. I mean, they're using, they're spraying this stuff on, they're putting this stuff on, and uh, this is all industrial chemical agriculture. So I'm not knocking it, I'm just saying what it is. And uh, this is just going to be another uh, thing that we're gonna have to deal with. And if we get the weather that I'm suggesting we're gonna get, then we have the potential also of affecting yields on the front and back end of the growing season. So we'll see how that goes, but I'll be talking about this more in this week's, in this month's newsletter. Um, and uh, that will be coming probably, like I said, later in the first week of uh, November. I've not really i've really got to bear down and get that issue done i haven't uh I, i've put together a lot of the information i just haven't written it yet uh, it's time is i just a lot of time is being sucked up with this current job so anyways uh, i wanted to bring that to your attention i don't think a lot of people are talking about this but i think it's going to become more newsworthy as we move forward uh into 2022 so again, uh, coal, uh, BTU, Peabody Energy had earnings this week. It didn't seem to play very well. We've also seen a peaking in some coal prices, but <clears throat> understand that you know we've had some big spikes in the coal prices. They were bound to pull in a little bit. I think a lot of people were kind of disappointed in Peabody's earnings, um, but you know these prices are not just gonna go up for one quarter. Uh, I think we're in an energy crisis that may last for a while. And, you know, let's let the, you know, it takes a while for the company, companies sometimes, we saw the same thing with Antero Resources, right? They had a lot of hedges on, it was hard to understand the earnings if you weren't good with accounting, but in the end, you knew that the company was making the right moves. Um, Peabody's doing something similar in my view. They're deleveraging the company as quickly as they can. And they're doing it in the context uh, of rising cash flows and improving operations. So this is a general article about coal. Coal was supposed to be headed to the dustbin of history as the world increasingly embraces renewable energy. But it turns out that weaning the world off fossil fuels, particularly the dirtiest fuel of them all, isn't going to be easy or quick as coal's price and demand have been revived this year. 
transitions take time. Gee, where have we heard that before? I've only been saying that for the last two years. All these politicians and all these nitwits had everybody convinced to just snap their fingers. And it was just a, it was just a matter of passing a bill, right? We just need to pass a bill in Congress and this will happen. This thing takes decades and it takes a lot more effort than they're putting into it. Quote, from our point of view, the energy transition was always a multi-decade story. Yep, that's what we've been saying here, said Biff <laughs> Orso, Senior Managing Director, Duveen Real Assets. Quote, and there's invariably going to be periods of spikes in demand or supply demand imbalances that was going to cause a resurgence in carbon-based generation sources. Yep, that's what we're saying. That's what we think is going to happen. So even if the coal price, you know, we saw comes back in, we saw something similar with lumber. We had a big spike in lumber. Um, everybody freaked out. It did pull back, but the price that it landed at is still, you know, a 10-year high. So it's not like, you know, prices went to $1,000, 100 board feet or whatever the, whatever the uh, measuring stick is, then pulled back to like 500 that's still way above the 200 that it previously traded at. So uh, I think something similar will happen in coal, a more sustainable, longer term, higher price. And then these companies just begin to heal over time. And then you see occasional um, price spikes because the pressure, uh, the ESG pressure, the political pressure on these companies is not gonna evaporate uh, just because we have a bad winter. Uh, these politicians in the West, uh, are bound and determined to do this build back better green thing and the appetite for investing in these dirty fuel sources is just not there. So I think that will limit the ability of producers to bring on capacity and bring the bull market to a early end, which has happened in the past. So I wanted to show this, this is in Denmark. People are reduced to using wood to stay warm. Uh, this is a tweet from Casper Jensen, another guy I follow on Twitter. It's happening. Firewood is beginning to be sold out all over Denmark. As energy prices are exploding around the world, firewood are the only available energy source that's still cheap and not taxed and therefore in high demand right now. Get it before your neighbor. So I don't read Danish, but uh, they are sold out here. So I don't know if that's the case there. I don't know. You know, I, I thought this was a good anecdote. You know, I remember watching Dr. Shivago and they were running out of fuel in the capital was a winter and he, he was out stealing firewood from the fences. And that's when he met his brother, who was a KGB agent or policeman, secret policeman. So that was a that was a crime punishable by uh, I think death or imprisonment. You 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 weren't allowed to tear things down and burn burn them. So, um, but anyways, this is where we're at, right? We're in an energy crisis. You're going to see anecdotes like this. Um, people are going to resort to whatever they have to 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 meet their needs uh, as natural gas prices, coal prices, and oil prices uh, go up or even in some cases are not available. All right, guys, I think that's it for this week. I'm kind of tuckered out here. Like I said, I apologize, this is so late, but uh, I wanted to get it on the board Saturday. Um, so we appreciate the, the growth in the channel. I mean, we're really getting a lot of good comments. People really seem to find value in what we're doing and I appreciate it. Uh, most of the comments, I'd say 99% of them are positive. There's always going to be a certain amount of trolls. I don't bother. I've been doing this so long now, it doesn't bother me anymore. I don't care. There's a couple guys that I do like that I get uh, some laughs out of. Uh, I believe there's a guy down in Australia or New Zealand that likes to rib me about uh, populism and uh, the fourth turning and Mr. Trump, but uh, I get enjoyment out of some of that stuff. So can't take things too seriously. So that's it for this week, guys. Appreciate it. And we'll talk to you next week. Thank you.